Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Ancient Sorceries Case Number 2 by Algernon Blackwood Part 1 There are, it would appear, certain wholly unremarkable persons with none of the characteristics that invite adventure, who yet once or twice in the course of their smooth lives undergo an experience so strange that the world catches its breath and looks the other way. And it was cases of this kind, perhaps more than any other, that fell into the widespread net of John's silence the psychic doctor, and appealing to his deep humanity, to his patience, and to his great qualities of spiritual sympathy, that often to the revelation of problems of the strangest complexity and of the profoundest possible human interest, matters that seemed almost too curious and fantastic for belief, he loved to trace to their hidden resources, to unravel a tangle in the very soul of things, and to release a suffering human soul in the process was with him a veritable passion, and the Nazi untied were indeed often passing strange. The world, of course, asks for some plausible basis to which it can attach credence, something it can at least pretend to explain, the adventurous type it can understand. Such people carry about with them an adequate explanation of their exciting lives, and their characters obviously drive them into the circumstances which produce the adventures. It expects nothing else from them, and is satisfied. But dull, ordinary folk have no right to out-of-the-way experiences, and the world having been led to expect otherwise is disappointed with them, not to say shocked. Its complacent judgment has been rudely disturbed. Such a thing happened to that man? It cries, a commonplace person like that? It is too absurd. There must be something wrong. Yet, there could be no question that something did actually happen to little Arthur Vezin, something of the curious nature he described to Dr. Silence. Outwardly or inwardly, it happened beyond a doubt, and in spite of the jeers of his few friends who heard the tale and observed wisely that such a thing might perhaps have come to Izzard, that crack brain Izzard, or to that odd fish Minsky, but it could never have happened to commonplace little Vezin who was foreordained to live and die, according to scale. But, whatever his methods of death was, Vezin certainly did not live according to scale, so far as this particular event in his otherwise uneventful life was concerned. And to hear him recount it, and watch his pale, delicate features change, and hear his voice grow softer and more hushed as he proceeded, was to know the conviction that his halting words perhaps failed sometimes to convey. He lived the thing over again each time he told it. His whole personality became muffled in the recital. It subdued him more than ever, so that the tale became a lengthy apology for an experience that he deprecated. He appeared to excuse himself and ask your pardon for having dared to take part in so fantastic an episode. For little Vezin was a timid, gentle, sensitive soul, rarely able to assert himself tender to man and beast, and almost constitutionally unable to say no, or to claim many things that should rightly have been his. His whole scheme of life seemed utterly remote from anything more exciting than missing a train or losing an umbrella on an omnibus. And when this curious event came upon him, he was already more years beyond forty than his friends suspected or he cared to admit. John Silence, who heard him speak of his experience more than once, said that he sometimes left out certain details and put in others, yet they were all obviously true. The whole scene was unforgettably captured onto his mind. None of the details were imagined or invented, and when he told the story with them all complete, the effect was undeniable. His appealing brown eyes shone, and much of the charming personality, usually so carefully repressed, came forward 
and revealed itself. His modesty was always there, of course, but in the telling he forgot the present and allowed himself to appear almost vividly as he lived again in the past of his adventure. He was on the way home when it happened, crossing northern France from some mountain trip or other, where he buried himself solitary-wise every summer. He had nothing but an unregistered bag in the rack, and the train was jammed to suffocation, most of the passengers being unredeemed holiday English. He disliked them, not because they were his fellow countrymen, but because they were noisy and obtrusive, obliterating with their big limbs and tweed clothing all the quieter tints of the day that brought him satisfaction and enabled him to melt into insignificance and forget that he was anybody. These English clashed about him like a brass band, making him feel vaguely that he ought to be more self-assertive and obstreperous and that he did not claim insistently enough all kinds of things that he didn't want and they were really valueless, such as corner seats, windows up or down, and so forth so that he felt uncomfortable in the train and wished the journey were over and he was back again living with his unmarried sister in Surbiton. And when the train stopped for ten panting minutes at the little station in northern France and he got out to stretch his legs on the platform and saw to his dismay a further batch of the British Isles debouching from another train, it suddenly seemed impossible to him to continue the journey. Even his flabby soul revolted and the idea of staying a night in the little town and going on next day by a slower, emptier train flashed into his mind. The guard was already shouting, En voiture! And the corridor of his compartment was already packed when the thought came to him, and for once he acted with decision and rushed to snatch his bag. Finding the corridor and steps impassable, he tapped at the window, for he had a corner seat, and begged the Frenchman who sat opposite to hand his luggage out to him, explaining in his wretched French that he intended to break the journey there, and this elderly Frenchman, he declared, gave him a look half of warning, half of reproach, that to his dying day he could never forget, handed the bag through the window of the moving train, and at the same time poured into his ears a long sentence, spoken rapidly and low, of which he was able to comprehend only the last few words, a casse de sommeil, a casse de chats. In reply to Dr. Silence, whose singular psychic acuteness at once seized upon this Frenchman as a vital point in the adventure, Vezin admitted that the man had impressed him favorably from the beginning, though without being able to explain why. They had sat facing one another during the four hours of the journey, and though no conversation had passed between them, Vezin was timid about his stuttering French. He confessed that his eyes were being continually drawn to his face, almost he felt to rudeness that each, by a dozen nameless little politeness and attentions, had evinced the desire to be kind. The men liked each other, and their personalities did not clash, or would not have clashed had they chanced to come to terms of acquaintance. The Frenchman, indeed, seemed to have exercised a silent protective influence over the insignificant little Englishman, and without words or gestures betrayed that he wished him well, and would gladly have been of service to him. And this sentence that he hurled at you, after the bag, asked John Silence, smiling that peculiarly sympathetic smile that always melted the prejudices of his patient. Were you able to follow it exactly? It was so quick and low and vehement, explained Van Zan, in his small voice, that I missed practically the whole of it. I only caught the few words at the very end, because he spoke them so clearly, and his face was bent down out of the carriage window so near to mine. A cast? The sommeil a cause de chats, replied Dr. Silence, as though half speaking to himself. That's exactly it, said Vezen, which I take it means something like because of sleep and because of the cats, doesn't it? Certainly, that's how I should translate it, the doctor observed shortly, evidently not wishing to interrupt more than necessary. And the rest of the sentence, all the first part, I couldn't understand, I mean was a warning not to do something, not to stop in the town, or at some particular place in the town, perhaps? That was the impression it made on me. Then, of course, the train wished off and left Vanzen, standing on the platform along and rather forlorn. The little town climbed in straggling fashion up a sharp hill rising out of the plain of the back of the station and was crowned by the twin towers of the ruined cathedral peeping over the summit, 
From the station itself it looked uninteresting and modern, but the fact was that the medieval position lay out of sight, just beyond the crest, and once he reached the top and entered the old streets and stepped clean out of modern life into a bygone century. The noise and bustle of the crowded train seemed days away. The spirit of this silent hill town, remote from tourists and motor cars, dreaming its own quiet life under the autumn sun, rose up and cast its spell upon him. Long before he recognized the spell, he acted under it. He walked softly, almost on tiptoe, down the winding narrow streets where the gables all but met over his head, and he entered the doorway of the solitary inn with a deprecating and modest demeanor that was in itself an apology for intruding upon the place and disturbing its dream. At first, however, when Zan said, he noticed very little of all this. The attempt at analysis came much later. When struck him, then was only the delightful contrast of the silence and peace after the dust and noisy rattle of the train. He felt soothed and stroked like a cat. Like a cat, you said, interrupted John Silence, quickly catching him up. Yes. At the very start, I felt like that, he laughed apologetically. I felt as though the warmth and the stillness and the comfort made me purr. It seemed to be the general mood of the whole place then. The inn, a rambling ancient house, the atmosphere of the old coaching day still about, apparently did not welcome him too warmly. He felt he was only tolerated, he said, but it was cheap and comfortable, and the delicious cup of afternoon tea he ordered at once made him feel really very pleased with himself for leaving the train in this bold, original way. For, to him it had seemed bold and original. He felt something of a dog. His room, too, soothed him with his dark paneling and low, irregular ceiling, and the long, sloping passage that led to it seemed a natural pathway to a real chamber of sleep, a little dim cubbyhole out of the world where noise could not enter. It looked upon the courtyard at the back, it was all very charming and made him think of himself as dressed in very soft velvet somehow, and the floors seemed padded, the walls provided with cushions. The sounds of the streets could not penetrate there. It was an atmosphere of absolute rest that surrounded him. On engaging the two-franc room, he had interviewed the only person who seemed to be about that sleepy afternoon, an elderly waiter with dundreary whiskers and a drowsy courtesy, who had ambled lazily towards him across the stone yard, but on coming downstairs again for a little promenade in the town, before dinner he encountered the proprietress herself. She was a large woman whose hands, feet, and features seemed to swim towards him out of a sea of person. They emerged, so to speak, but she had great dark vivacious eyes that counteracted the bulk of her body and betrayed the fact that in reality she was both vigorous and alert. When he first caught sight of her, she was knitting in a low chair against the sunlight of the wall, and something at once made him see her as a great tabby cat, dozing yet awake, heavily sleepy, and yet at the same time prepared for instantaneous action. A great mouser on the watch occurred to him. She took him in with a single comprehensive glance that was polite. Without being cordial, her neck, he noticed, was extraordinarily supple in spite of its proportions, for it turned so easily to follow him, and the head it carried bowed so very flexibly. But when she looked at me, you know, he said Van Zandt, with that little apologetic smile in his brown eyes, and that faintly deprecating gesture of the shoulders that was characteristically of him, the odd notion came to me that really she had intended to make quite a different movement, and that with a single bound she could have leaped at me across the width of that stone yard and pounced upon me, like some huge cat upon a mouse. He laughed, a little laugh, and Dr. Silence made a note in his book without interrupting while Van Zandt proceeded in a tone as though he feared he had already told too much and more than we could believe. Very soft, yet very active she was, for all her size and mass, and I felt she knew what I was doing even after I had passed and was behind her back. She spoke to me and her voice was smooth and running, she asked if I had my luggage and was comfortable in my room, and then added that dinner was at seven o'clock and that they were very early people in this little country town. Clearly, she intended to convey that late hours were not encouraged. Evidently, she contrived by voice and manner to give him the impression that he would be managed and everything would be arranged and planned for him, 
and that he had nothing to do but fall into the groove and obey. No decided action or sharp personal effort would be looked for from him. It was the very reverse of the train. He walked quietly out into the street, feeling soothed and peaceful. He realized that he was in a milieu that suited him and stroked him the right way. It was so much easier to be obedient. He began to purr again and to feel that all the town purred with him. About the streets of that little town, he meandered gently, falling deeper and deeper into the spirit of repose that characterized it. With no special aim, he wandered up and down and to and fro. The September sunshine fell slantingly over the roofs. Down winding alleyways fringed with tumbling gables and open casements, he caught fairy-like glimpses of the great plain below and of the meadows and yellow copses lying like a dream map in the haze. The spell of the past held very potently here, he felt. The streets were full of picturesquely garbed men and women, all busy enough, going their respective ways, but no one took any notice of him or turned to stare at his obviously English appearance. He was even able to forget that with his tourist appearance he was a false note in a charming picture, and he melted more and more into the scene, feeling delightfully insignificant and unimportant and unselfconscious. It was like becoming part of a softly colored dream which he did not even realize to be a dream. On the eastern side, the hill fell away more sharply and the plain below ran off rather suddenly into a sea of gathering shadows in which the little patches of woodland looked like islands and the stubble fields like deep water. Here he strolled along the old ramparts of ancient fortifications that once had been formidable, but now were only vision-like with their charming mingling of broken gray walls and wayward vine and ivy. From the broad coping on which he sat for a moment, level with the rounded tops of clipped plane trees, he saw the esplanade far below lying in shadow. Here and there a yellow sunbeam crept in and lay upon the fallen yellow leaves, and from the height he looked down and saw that the townsfolk were walking to and fro in the cool of the evening. He could just hear the sound of their slow footfalls, and the murmur of their voices floated up to him through the gaps between the trees. The figures looked like shadows as he caught glimpses of their quiet movements far below. He sat there for some time pondering, bathed in the waves of murmurs and half-lost echoes that rose to his ears, muffled by the leaves of the plane tree. The whole town and the little hill out of which it grew as naturally as an ancient wood seemed to him like a being lying there half asleep on the plain and crooning to itself as it dozed. And presently as he sat lazily melting into its dream, a sound of horns and strings and wood instruments rose to his ears, and the town band began to play at the far end of the crowded terrace below, the accompaniment of a very soft, deep-throated drum. Benzan was very sensitive to music, knew about it intelligently, and had even ventured, unknown to his friends, upon the composition of quiet melodies with low-running chords, which he played to himself with a soft pedal when no one was about and this music floating up through the trees from an invisible and doubtless very picturesque band of the townspeople woefully charmed him. He recognized nothing that they played, and it sounded as though they were simply improvising without a conductor. No definitely marked time ran through the pieces, which ended and began oddly after the fashion of wind through an aeolian harp. It was part of the place and scene, just as the dying sunlight and faintly breathing wind were part of the scene and hour and the mellow notes of old-fashioned plaintive horns pierced here and there by the sharper strings all half smothered by the continuous booming of the deep drum touched his soul with a curiously potent spell that was almost too engrossing to be quite pleasant there was a certain queer sense of bewitchment in it all the music seemed to him oddly unartificial it made him think of trees swept by the wind of night breezes singing along wires and chimney stacks or in the rigging of invisible ships, or, and a smile leaped up in his thoughts with a sudden sharpness of just suggestion, a chorus of animals, of wild creatures, somewhere in desolate places of the world crying and singing as animals will, to the moon. He could fancy he heard the wailing half-human cries of cats upon the tiles at night, rising and falling with weird intervals of sound, and this music, muffled by distance in the trees, made him think of a queer company of these creatures on some roof far away in the sky, uttering their solemn music to one another and the moon in chorus. It was, he felt, at the time, a singular image to occur to him, yet it expressed 
its sensations pictorially better than anything else. The instruments played such impossibly odd intervals, and the crescendos and diminuendos were so very suggestive of Catlan on the tiles at night, rising swiftly, dropping without warning to deep notes again, and all in such strange confusion of discords and accords. But at the same time, a plaintive sweetness resulted on the whole, and the discords of these half-broken instruments were so singular that they did not come in to distress his musical soul like fiddles out of tune. He listened with a long time, wholly surrendered himself as his character was, and then strolled homewards in the dusk as the air grew chilly. There was nothing to alarm, put in Dr. Silence briefly. Absolutely nothing, said Venzan. But you know, it was all so fantastical and charming that my imagination was profoundly impressed. Perhaps, too, he continued, gently explanatory, it was the stirring of my imagination that caused other impressions. For as I walked back, the spell of this place began to steal over me in a dozen ways, though all intelligible ways. But there were other things I could not account for in the least, even then. Incidents, you mean? Hardly incidents, I think. A lot of vivid sensations crowded themselves upon my mind, and I could trace them to no causes. It was just after sunset, and the tumbled old buildings traced magical outlines against an opalescent sky of gold and red. The dusk was running down the twisted streets. All around the hill, the plain pressed in like a dim sea, its level rising with the darkness. The spell of this kind of scene, you know, can be very moving, and it was so that night. Yet I felt that what came to me had nothing directly to do with the mystery and wonder of the scene. Not merely the subtle transformation of the spirit that come with beauty, put in the doctor, noticing his hesitation. Exactly, Venzan went on, duly encouraged and no longer so fearful of our smiles at his expense. The impressions came from somewhere else. For instance, down the busy main street where men and women were bustling home from work, shopping at stalls and barrows, idly gossiping in groups, and all the rest of it, I saw that I aroused no interest and that no one turned to stare at me as a foreigner and stranger. I was utterly ignored, and my presence among them excited no special interest or attention. And then, quite suddenly, it dawned upon me with a conviction that all the time this indifference and inattention were merely feigned. Everybody, as a matter of fact, was watching me closely. Every movement I made was known and observed. Ignore me was all a pretense, an elaborate pretense. He paused a moment and looked at us to see we were smiling and then continued reassured. It is useless to ask me how I noticed this because I simply cannot explain it, but the discovery gave me something of a shock. Before I got back to the end, however, another curious thing rose up strongly in my mind and forced my recognition of it as true. And this too, I may as well say at once, was equally inexplicable to me. I mean, I can only give you the fact as fact it was to me. The little man left his chair and stood on the mat before the fire. His diffidence lessened from now onwards, as he lost himself again in the magic of the old adventure. His eyes shone a little already as he talked. Well, he went on, his soft voice rising somewhat with his excitement. I was in a shop. When it came to me first, though the idea must have been at work for a long time subconsciously to appear in so complete a form all at once, I was buying socks, I think, he laughed and struggling with my dreadful French, when it struck me that the woman in the shop did not care two pins whether I bought anything or not. She was indifferent whether she made a sale or did not make a sale. She was only pretending to sell. This sounds a very small and fanciful incident to build upon what follows, but really it was not small. I mean, it was the spark that lit the line of powder and ran along to the big blaze in my mind. For the whole town, I suddenly realized, was something other than I so far saw it. The real activities and interests of the people were somewhere and otherwise than appeared. Their true lives lay somewhere out of sight, behind the scenes. Their busyness was but the outward semblance that masked their actual purposes. They bought and sold and ate and drank and walked about the street, yet all the while the mainstream of their existence lay somewhere beyond my ken underground, in secret places, and the shops, 
and the stalls, they did not care whether I purchased their articles or not. At the end, they were indifferent to my staying or going. Their life lay remote from my own, springing from hidden mysterious sources, coursing out of sight unknown. It was all a great elaborate pretense, assumed possibly for my benefit, or possibly for purposes of their own, but the main current of their energies ran elsewhere. I almost felt as an unwelcome foreign substance might be expected to feel when it has found its way into the human system, and the whole body organizes itself to eject it or absorb it. The town was doing this very thing to me. This bizarre notion presented itself forcibly to my mind as I walked home to the inn, and I began busily to wonder where in the true life of this town could lie, and what were the actual interests and activities of its hidden life. And now that my eyes were partly open, I noticed other things too that puzzled me, first of which I think was the extraordinary silence of the whole place. Positively, the town was muffled. Although the streets were paved with cobbles, the people moved about silently, softly, with padded feet like cats. Nothing made noise, all was hushed, subdued, muted. The very voices were quiet, low-pitched like in a drowsy atmosphere of soft dreaming that soothed this little hill town into its sleep. It was like the woman at the inn, an outward repose screening intense inner activity and purpose. Yet, there was no sign of lethargy or sluggishness anywhere about it. The people were active and alert. Only a magical and uncanny softness lay over them all like a spell. Vizan passed his hand across his eyes for a moment, as though the memory had become very vivid. His voice had run off into a whisper so that we heard the last part with difficulty. He was telling a true thing, obviously, yet something that he both liked and hated telling. I went back to the inn, he continued presently, in a louder voice, and dined. I felt a new strange world about me. My old world of reality receded. Here, whether I liked it or no, was something new and incomprehensible. I regretted having left a train so impulsively. An adventure was upon me, and I loathed adventures as foreign to my nature. Moreover, this was the beginning apparently of an adventure somewhere deep within me, in a region I could not check or measure, and a feeling of alarm mingled itself with my wonder, alarm for the stability of what I had for forty years recognized as my personality. I went upstairs to bed, my mind teeming with thoughts that were unusual to me and of rather a haunting description. By way of relief, I kept thinking of that nice, prosaic, noisy train and all those wholesome, blustering passengers. I almost wish I were with them again, but my dreams took me elsewhere. I dreamed of cats and soft-moving creatures and the silence of life in a dim, muffled world beyond the senses. Part 2 When Zan stayed on from day to day, indefinitely much longer than he had intended, he felt in a kind of dazed, somnolent condition, he did nothing in particular, but the place fascinated him, and he could not decide to leave. Decisions were always very difficult for him, and he sometimes wondered how he had ever brought himself to the point of leaving the train. It seemed as though someone else must have arranged it for him, and once or twice his thoughts ran to the swarthy Frenchman who had sat opposite. If only he could have understood that long sentence, ending so strangely with a casse sommeil et a cause de chats. He wondered what it all meant. Meanwhile, the hushed softness of the town held him prisoner, and he sought in his muddling, gentle way to find out where the mystery lay and what it was all about. But his limited French and his constitutional hatred of active investigation made it hard for him to buttonhole anybody and ask questions. He was content to observe and watch and remain negative. The weather held on calm and hazy, and this just suited him. He wandered about the town till he knew every street and alley. The people suffered him to come and go without let or hindrance, though it became clearer to him every day that he was never free himself from observation. The town watched him as a cat watches a mouse, and he got no nearer to finding out what they were all so busy with or where the mainstream of their activities lay. This remained hidden. The people were as soft and mysterious as cats but that he was continually under observation became more evident from day to day. For instance, when he strolled to the end of the town and entered a little green public garden beneath the ramparts 
and seated himself upon one of the empty benches in the sun. He was quite alone at first. Not another seat was occupied. The little park was empty, the paths deserted. Yet within ten minutes of his coming, there must have been fully twenty persons scattered about him, some strolling aimlessly along the gravel walks, staring at the flowers, and others seated on the wooden benches enjoying the sun like himself. None of them appeared to take any notice of him. Yet he understood quite well they had all come there to watch. They kept him under close observation. In the streets they had seemed busy enough, hurrying upon various errands, yet these were suddenly all forgotten and they had nothing to do but loll and laze in the sun, their duties unremembered. Five minutes after he left, the garden was again deserted. The seats were vacant, but in the crowded street it was the same thing again. He was never alone. He was ever in their thoughts. By degrees, too, he began to see how it was so cleverly watched, yet without the appearance of it. The people did nothing directly. They behaved obliquely. He laughed. In his mind, as the thought thus clothed itself in words, but the phrase exactly described it. They looked at him from angles which naturally should have led their sight in another direction altogether. Their movements were oblique, too, so far as these concerned himself. The straight directing thing was not their way, evidently. They did nothing, obviously. If he entered a shop to buy, the woman walked instantly away and busied herself with something at the further end of the counter, though answering at once when he spoke showing that she knew he was there and that this was only her way of attending to him. It was the fashion of the cat she followed. Even in the dining room of the inn, the bewhiskered and courteous waiter, lithe and silent in all his movements, never seemed able to come straight to his table for an order or dish. He came by zigzags, indirectly, vaguely, so that he appeared to be going to another table altogether and only turned suddenly at the last moment and was there beside him. Vazan smiled curiously to himself, as he described how he began to realize these things. Other tourists there were none in the hostel, but he recalled the figures of one or two old men, inhabitants, who took their déjeuner and dinner tray there, and remembered how fantastically they entered the room in similar fashion. First they paused in the doorway, peering about the room, and then, after a temporary inspection, they came in, as it were, sideways, keeping close to the wall, so that he wondered which table they were making for, and at the last minute making almost a little quick run to their particular seats, and again he thought of the ways and methods of cats. Other small incidents, too, impressed him as all part of this queer, soft town, with its muffled, indirect life, for the way some of the people appeared and disappeared with extraordinary swiftness puzzled him exceedingly. It may have all been perfectly natural. He knew yet he could not make it out how the alleyway swallowed them up and shot them forth in a second of time, when there were no visible doorways or openings near enough to explain the phenomenon. Once he followed two elderly women who he felt had been particularly examining him from across the street, quite near the inn this was, and saw them turn the corner a few feet only in front of him. Yet when he sharply followed on their heels, he saw nothing but an utterly deserted alley stretching in front of him with no sign of a living thing, and the only opening through which they could have escaped was a porch some fifty yards away, which not the swiftest human runner could have reached in time. And just sudden fashion people appeared when he never expected them. Once, when he heard a great noise of fighting going on behind a low wall and hurried up to see what was going on, what should he see but a group of girls and women engaged in vociferous conversation, which instantly hushed itself to the normal whispering note of the town when his hair had appeared over the wall, and even then none of them turned to look at him directly, but slunk off with an almost unaccountable rapidity into doors and sheds across the yard. And their voices, he thought, had sounded so like, so strangely like, the angry snarling of fighting animals, almost of cats. The whole spirit of the town, however, continued to evade him as something elusive, protean, screened from the outer world, and at the same time intensely, genuinely vital. And since he now formed part of its life, this concealment puzzled and irritated him more. It began rather to frighten him. Out of the mist that slowly gathered about these ordinary surface thoughts, there arose again the idea that the inhabitants were waiting for him to declare himself, to take an attitude, to do this or to do that, and that when he had done so, they in their turn would at length 
make some direct response, accepting or rejecting him, yet the vital matter concerning which his decision was awaited came no nearer to him. Once or twice he purposely followed little processions or groups of the citizens in order to find out, if possible, on what purpose they were bent, but they always discovered him in time and dwindled the way, each individual going his or own way. It was always the same. He never could learn what their main interest was. The cathedral was ever empty, the old church of St. Martin, at the other end of the town, deserted. They shopped because they had to and not because they wished to. The booths stood neglected, the stalls unvisited, the little cafes desolate, yet the streets were always full and the townsfolk ever on the bustle. Can it be, he thought to himself, yet with a deprecating laugh, that he should have dared to think anything so odd. Can it be that these people are people of the twilight? That they live only at night their real life and come out honestly only with the dusk? That during the day they make a sham, though brave pretense, and after the sun is down, their true life begins? Have they the souls of night things, and is the whole blessed town in the hands of the cats? The fancy somehow electrified him with little shocks of shrinking and dismay. Yet, though he affected to laugh, he knew that he was beginning to feel more than uneasy, and that strange forces were tugging with a thousand invisible cords at the very center of his being, something utterly remote from his ordinary life, something that had not waked for years, began faintly to stir in his soul, sending feelers abroad into his brain and heart, shaping queer thoughts and penetrating even into certain of his minor actions, something exceedingly vital to himself, to his soul, hung in the balance. And always when he returned to the inn about the hour of sunset, he saw the figures of the townsfolk stealing through the dusk from their shop doors moving sentry-wise to and fro at the corners of the streets, yet always vanishing silently like shadows at his near approach. And at the end, when it invariably closed its doors at ten o'clock, he had never yet found the opportunity. He rather have heartily sought to see for himself what account the town could give of itself at night. A cause de semelle et a cause de chats. The words now rang in his ears more and more often, though still as yet without any definite means. Moreover, something made him sleep like the dead. Part 3 It was, I think, on the fifth day, though in this detail his story sometimes varied, that he made definite rediscovery, which increased his alarm and brought him up to a rather sharp climax. Before that he had already noticed that a change was going forward, and certain subtle transformations being brought about in his character, which modified several of his minor habits, and yet affected to ignore them. Here, however, was something he could no longer ignore, and it startled him. At the best of times, he was never very positive, always negative, rather compliant and acquiescent. Yet when necessity arose, he was capable of reasonably vigorous action and could take a strongish decision. The discovery he now made that brought him with such a sharp turn was that this power had positively dwindled to nothing. He found it impossible to make up his mind, for on this fifth day he realized that he had stayed long enough in the town and that for reasons he could only vaguely define to himself it was wiser and safer that he should leave. And he found that he could not leave. This is difficult to describe in words, and it was more by gesture and the expression of his face that he conveyed to Dr. Silence the state of impotence he had reached. All this spying and watching, he said, had, as it were, spun a net about his feet so that he was trapped and powerless to escape. He felt like a fly that had blundered into the intricacies of a great web. He was caught, imprisoned, and could not get away. It was a distressing sensation. A numbness had crept over his will till he had become almost incapable of decision. The mere thought of vigorous action, action towards escape, began to terrify him. All the currents of his life had turned inwards upon himself, striving to bring to the surface something that lay buried almost beyond reach, determined to force his recognition of something he had long forgotten, forgotten years upon years, centuries almost ago. It seemed as though a window deep within his being would presently open and reveal an entirely new world, yet somehow a world that was not unfamiliar. Beyond that, again, he fancied a great curtain hung, and when that too rolled up, he could see still further into this region and at last understand something 
of the secret life of these extraordinary people. Is this why they wait and watch, he asked himself, with rather a shaking heart, for the time when I shall join them or refuse to join them? Does the decision rest with me after all, and not with them? And it was at this point that the sinister character of the adventure first really declared itself, and he became genuinely alarmed. The stability of his rather fluid little personality was at stake, he felt, and something in his heart turned coward. Why otherwise should he have suddenly taken to walking stealthily, silently, making as little sound as possible, forever looking behind him? Why else should he have moved almost on tiptoe about the passages of the practically deserted inn, and when he was abroad have found himself deliberately taking advantage of what cover presented itself? And why, if he was not afraid, should the wisdom of staying indoors after stand down have suddenly occurred to him as imminently desirable? Why, indeed? And when John's silence gently pressed him for an explanation of these things, he admitted apologetically that he had none to give. It was simply that I feared something might happen to me unless I kept a sharp lookout. I felt afraid. It was instinctive, was all he could say. I got the impression that the whole town was after me, wanted me for something that if it got me, I should lose myself for at least the self I knew in some unfamiliar state of unconsciousness. But I am not a psychologist, you know, he added meekly, and I cannot define it better than that. It was while lounging in the courtyard half an hour before the evening meal that Van Zandt made the discovery, and he at once went upstairs to his quiet room at the end of the winding passage to think it over alone. In the yard it was empty enough, true, but there was always a possibility that the big woman, whom he dreaded, would come out of some door with her pretense of knitting to sit and watch him. This had happened several times, and he could not endure the sight of her. He still remembered his original fancy, bizarre though it was, that she would spring upon him the moment his back was turned and land with one single crushing leap upon his neck. Of course it was nonsense, but then it haunted him. And once an idea begins to do that, it ceases to be nonsense. It has closed itself in reality. He went upstairs accordingly. It was dusk and the oil lamps had not yet been lit in the passages. He stumbled over the uneven surface of the ancient flooring, passing the dim outlines of doors along the corridor doors that he had never once seen open, rooms that seemed never occupied. He moved as his habit now was stealthily and on tiptoe. Halfway down the last passage to his own chamber there was a sharp turn, and it was just here, while groping around the walls with outstretched hands, that his fingers touched something that was not wall, something that moved. It was soft and warm in texture, indescribably fragrant, and about the height of his shoulder, and immediately thought of a furry, sweet-smelling kitten. The next minute he knew it was something quite different. Instead of investigating, however, his nerves must have been too overwrought for that, he said. He shrank back as closely as possible against the wall on the other side. The thing, whatever it was, slipped past him with a sound of rustling and retreating with light footsteps down the passage behind him. It was gone. A breath of warm, scented air was wafted to his nostrils. Benzan caught his breath for an instant and paused, stock still, half leaning against the wall, and then almost ran down the remaining distance and entered his room with a rush, locking the door hurriedly behind him. Yet it was not fear that made him run. It was excitement, pleasurable excitement. His nerves were tingling and a delicious glow made itself felt all over his body. In a flash it came to him that this was just what he had felt 25 years ago, as a boy when he was in love for the first time. Warm currents of life ran all over him and mounted to his brain in a whirl of soft delight. His mood was suddenly become tender, melting, loving. The room was quite dark and he collapsed upon the sofa by the window, wondering what had happened to him and what it all meant. But the only thing he understood clearly in that instant was that something in him had swiftly, magically changed. He no longer wished to leave or to argue with himself about leaving. The encounter in the passageway had changed all that. The strange perfume of it still hung about him, bemusing his heart and mind, for he knew that it was a girl who had passed him, a girl's face that his fingers had brushed in the darkness, and he felt in some extraordinary way as though he had been actually kissed by her, kissed full upon the lips. Trembling, he sat upon the sofa by the window and struggled to collect his thoughts, 
He was utterly unable to understand how the mere passing of a girl in the darkness of a narrow passageway could communicate so electric a thrill to his whole being that he still shook with the sweetness of it. Yet there it was, and he found it as useless to deny as to attempt analysis. Some ancient fire had entered his veins and now ran coursing through his blood, and that he was forty-five instead of twenty did not matter one little jot. Out of all the inner turmoil and confusion emerged the one salient fact that the mere atmosphere, the merest casual touch of this girl, unseen, unknown, in the darkness, had been sufficient to stir dormant fires in the center of his heart and rouse his whole being from a state of feeble sluggishness to one of tearing and tumultuous excitement. After a time, however, the number of Vazin's years began to assert their cumulative power. He grew calmer, and when a knock came at length upon his door, and he heard the waiter's voice suggesting that dinner was nearly over, he pulled himself together and slowly made his way downstairs into the dining room. Everyone looked up as he entered, for he was very late, but he took his customary seat in the far corner and began to eat. The trepidation was still in his nerves, but the fact that he had passed through the courtyard and hall without catching sight of a petticoat served to calm him a little. He ate so fast that he had almost caught up with the current stage of the tape to hold when a slight commotion and the room drew his attention. His chair was so placed that the door and the greater portion of the long salle manger were behind him, yet it was not necessary to turn around to know that the same person he had passed in the dark passage had now come into the room. He felt a presence long before he heard or saw anyone. Then he became aware that the old man, the only other guests, were rising one by one in their place and exchanging greetings with someone who passed among them from table to table. And when at length he turned with his heart beating furiously to a certain for himself, he saw the form of a young girl, lithe and slim, moving down the center of the room and making straight for his own table in the corner. She moved wonderfully with sinuous grace like a young panther, and her approach filled him with such delicious bewilderment that he was utterly unable to tell at first what her face was like or discover what it was about the whole presentment of the creature that filled him anew with trepidation and delight. Ah, mademoiselle, et de retour, he heard the old waiter murmur at his side, and he was just able to take in that she was the daughter of the proprietress when she was upon him, and he heard her voice. She was addressing him, something of red lips he saw and laughing white teeth and stray wisp of fine dark hair about the temples, but all the rest was a dream in which his own emotions rose like a thick cloud before his eyes, and prevented his seeing accurately or knowing exactly what he did. He was aware that she greeted him with a charming little bow, that her beautiful large eyes looked searchingly into his own, that the perfume he had noticed in the dark passage again assailed his nostrils, and that she was bending a little towards him, and leaning with one hand on the table at his side. She was quite close to him. That was the chief thing he knew, explaining that she had been asking after the comfort of her mother's guest and was now introducing herself to the latest arrival, himself. Monsieur has already been here a few days, he heard the waiter say, and then her own voice, sweet as singing, he replied, Ah, but Monsieur is not going to leave us just yet, I hope. My mother is too old to look after the comfort of our guests properly, but now I am here, I will remedy all that. She laughed deliciously. Monsieur shall be well looked after. Van Zandt, struggling with his emotion and desire to be polite, half rose to acknowledge the pretty speech and to stammer some sort of reply. But as he did so, his hand, by chance, touched her own that was resting upon the table, and a shock that was all the world like a shock of electricity passed from her skin into his body. His soul wavered and shook deep within him, he caught her eyes fixed upon his own with a look of almost curious intentness. The next moment he knew that he had sat down wordless again on his chair, that the girl was already halfway across the room, and that he was trying to eat his salad with a dessert spoon and a knife. Longing for her return, and yet dreading it, he gulped down the remainder of his dinner and then went at once to his bedroom to be alone with his thoughts. This time the passages were lighted, and he suffered no exciting contrams. Yet the winding corridor was dim with shadows, and the last portion from the bend of the walls onwards seemed longer than it had ever known. It ran downhill like the pathway on a mountainside, and as he tiptoed softly down it, he felt 
the heart of a great forest. The world was seeing with him. Strange fancies filled his brain. And once in the room, with the door securely locked, he did not light the candles, but sat by the open thinking, long, long thoughts that came unbidden in troops to his mind. Part 4 This part of the story he told to Dr. Silence without special coaxing. It is true, yet with much stammering embarrassment. He could not in the least understand, he said, how the girl had managed to affect him so profoundly, and even before he had set eyes upon her, for her mere proximity in the darkness had been sufficient to set him on fire. He knew nothing of enchantments, for years had been a stranger to anything approaching tender relations with any member of the opposite sex, for he was encased in shyness and realized his overwhelming defects only too well. Yet his bewitching young creature came to him deliberately. Her manner was unmistakable and she sought him out on every possible occasion. Chaste and sweet she was undoubtedly, yet frankly inviting, and she won him utterly with the first glance of her shining eyes, even if she had not already done so in the dark merely by the magic of her invisible presence. You felt she was altogether wholesome and good, queried the doctor. You had no reaction of any sort, for instance, of alarm? Then Zan looked up sharply, with one of his little inimitable little apologetic smiles. It was some time before he replied. The bare memory of the adventure had suffused his sharp face with blushes, and his brown eyes sought the floor again before he answered. I don't think I can quite say that, he explained presently. I acknowledged certain qualms, sitting up in my room afterwards. A conviction grew upon me that there was something about her. How shall I express it? Well, something unholy. It is not impurity in any sense, physical or mental, that I mean, but something quite indefinable that gave me a vague sensation of the creeps. She drew me at the same time, repelled me more than, then. He hesitated, blushing furiously, and unable to finish the sentence. Nothing like it has ever come to me before or since, he concluded, with lame confusion. I suppose it was, as you suggested just now, something of an enchantment. At any rate, it was strong enough to make me feel that I would stay in that awful little haunted town for years, if only I could see her every day, hear her voice, watch her wonderful movements, and sometimes, perhaps, touch her hand. Can you explain to me what you felt was the source of her power? John Silence asked, looking purposely anywhere but at the narrator. I am surprised that you should ask me such a question, answered Venzan, with the nearest approach to dignity he could manage. I think no man can describe to another convincingly wherein lies the magic of the woman who ensnares him. I certainly cannot. I can only say this slip of a girl bewitched me, and the mere knowledge that she was living and sleeping in the same house filled me with an extraordinary sense of delight. But there's one thing I can tell you, he went on earnestly, his eyes aglow, namely, that she seemed to sum up and synthesize in herself all the strange hidden forces that operated so mysteriously in the town and its inhabitants. She had the silken movements of the panther going smoothly, silently to and fro, in the same indirect oblique methods as the townsfolk, screening like them secret purposes of her own, purposes that I was sure had me for their objective. She kept me to my terror and delight ceaselessly under observation, yet so carelessly, so consummately, that another man less sensitive, if I may say so, he made a deprecating gesture, or less prepared by what had gone before, would never have noticed it at all. She was always still, always reposeful, yet she seemed to be everywhere at once, so that I never could escape from her. I was continually meeting the stare and laughter of her great eyes, in the corners of the rooms, in the passages, calmly looking at me through the windows or in the busiest parts of the public streets. Their intimacy, it seems, grew very rapidly after this first encounter which had so violently disturbed the little man's equilibrium. He was naturally very prim, and prim folk live mostly in so small a world that anything violently unusual may shake them clean out of it, and they therefore instinctively distrust originality. But Van Zandt began to forget his primness after a while. The girl was always modestly behaved, and as her mother's representative, she naturally had to do with the guest in the hotel. It was not out of the way that a spirit of comedy should spring up. Besides, she was young, she was charmingly pretty, she was French, and she obviously liked him. 
at the same time, there was something indescribable, a certain indefinable atmosphere of other places, other times, that made him try hard to remain on his guard, and sometimes made him catch his breath with a sudden start. It was all rather like a delirious dream, half delight, half dread, he confided in a whisper to Dr. Silence, and more than once he hardly knew quite what he was doing or saying as though he were driven forward by impulses he scarcely recognized as his own, and though the thought of leaving presented itself again and again to his mind, it was each time with less insistence, so that he stayed on from day to day, becoming more and more part of the sleepy life of this dreamy medieval town, losing more and more of his recognizable personality. Soon he felt the curtain within would roll up with an awful rush, and he would find himself quite suddenly admitted into the secret purposes of the hidden life that lay behind it all. Only by that time he would have become transformed into an entirely different being. And meanwhile, he noticed various little signs of the intention to make his stay attractive to him. Flowers in his bedroom, a more comfortable armchair in the corner, and even little special extra dishes on his private table in the dining room. Conversations, too, with Mademoiselle Elsie became more and more frequent and pleasant, and although they seldom traveled beyond the weather or the details of the town, the girl, he noticed, was never in a hurry to bring them to an end, and often contrived to interject little odd sentences that he never properly understood, yet felt to be significant. And it was these stray remarks, full of a meaning that evaded him, that pointed to some hidden purpose of her own, and made him feel uneasy. They all had to do, he felt sure, with reasons for his staying on in the town indefinitely. And has Monsieur not even yet come to a decision? She said softly in his ear, sitting beside him in the sunny yard before Dejeuner, the acquaintance having progressed with significant rapidity. Because if it's so difficult, we must all try together to help him. The question startled him, following upon his own thoughts. It was spoken with a pretty laugh and a stray bit of hair across one eye as she turned and peered at him half roguishly. Possibly he did not quite understand the French of it, for her near presence always confused his small knowledge of the language distressingly. Yet the words and her manner and something else that lay behind it all in her mind frightened him. It gave such point to his feelings that the town was waiting for him to make his mind up on some important matter. At the same time, her voice and the fact that she was there so close beside him in her soft dark dress thrilled him inexpressibly. It is true, I find it difficult to leave, he stammered losing his way deliciously in the depths of her eyes, and especially now that Mademoiselle Issey has come. He was surprised at the success of his sentence and quite delighted with the little gallantry of it, but at the same time he could have bitten his tongue off for having said it. Then, after all you like our little town, or you would not be pleased to stay on, she said, ignoring the compliment. I am enchanted with it, and enchanted with you, he cried, feeling that his tongue was something slipping beyond his control of his brain, and he was on the verge of saying all manner of other things of the wildest description when the girl sprang lightly up from her chair beside him and made to go. It is soup à l'oignon today, she cried, laughing back at him through the sunlight, and I must go and see about it, otherwise you know Monsieur will not enjoy his dinner, and then perhaps he will leave us. He watched her cross the courtyard, Moving all the grace and lightness of the feline race, and her simple black dress clothed her, he thought, exactly like the fur of the same supple species. She turned once to laugh at him from the porch with a glass door, and then stopped a moment to speak to her mother, who sat knitting as usual in her corner seat just inside the hallway. But how was it then that the moment his eye fell upon this ungainly woman, the pair of them appeared suddenly as other than they were? Once came that transforming dignity and sense of power that enveloped them both as by magic. What was it about that mass of woman that made her appear instantly regal and set her on a throne in some dark and dreadful scenery, wielding a scepter over the red glare of some temptuous orgy? And why did this slender stripling of a girl, graceful as a willow, lithe as a young leopard, assume suddenly an air of sinister majesty and move with flame and smoke about her head in the darkness of night beneath her feet? Benzan caught his breath and sat there transfixed. Then, almost simultaneously with its appearance, the queer notion vanished again, and the sunlight of day caught them both, and he heard her laughing to her mother about the soup à l'oignon, 
and saw her glancing back at him over her dear little shoulder with a smile that made him think of a duke-kissed rose bending lightly before summer airs. And indeed, the onion soup was particularly excellent that day because he saw another cover laid at his small table and with fluttering heart heard the waiter murmur by way of explanation that Mademoiselle Issey would honor Monsieur today at déjeuner as her custom sometimes is with her mother's guests. So actually she sat by him all through that delirious meal, talking quietly to him in easy French, seeing that he was well looked after, mixing the salad dressing and even helping him with her own hand. And later in the afternoon, while he was smoking in the courtyard, longing for a sight of her as soon as her duties were done, she came again to his side, and when he rose to meet her, she stood facing him a moment, full of a perplexing sweet shyness before she spoke. My mother thinks she ought to know more of the beauties of our little town, and I think so too. Would Monsieur like me to be his guide? Perhaps. I can show him everything, for our family has lived here for many generations. She had him by the hand. Indeed, before he could find a single word to express his pleasure and led him all unresisting out into the street, yet in such a way that it seemed perfectly natural, she should do so and without the faintest suggestion of boldness or immodesty. Her face glowed with the pleasure and interest of it, and with her short dress and tumbled hair, she looked every bit the charming child of seventeen that she was, innocent and playful proud of her native town and alive beyond her years to the sense of its ancient beauty. So they went over the town together, and she showed him what she considered its chief interest, the tumbled-down old house where her forebears had lived, the somber, aristocratic-looking mansion where her mother's family dwelt for centuries, and the ancient marketplace where several hundred years before the witches had been burnt by the score. She kept up a lively running stream of talk about it all, of which he understood not a fiftieth part, as he trudged along by her side, cursing his forty-five years and feeling all the yearnings of his early manhood revive and jeer at him. And as she talked, England and Sir Bittans seemed very far away indeed, almost in another age of the world's history. Her voice touched something immeasurably old in him, something that slept deep. It lulled the surface parts of his consciousness to sleep allowing what was far more ancient to awaken, like the town, with its elaborate pretense of modern act of life. The upper layers of his being became dulled, soothed, muffled, while lay underneath began to stir in its sleep. The big curtains swayed a little to and fro presently. It might lift altogether. He began to understand a little better at last. The mood of the town was producing itself in him, in proportion as his ordinary external self became muffled, that inner secret life that was far more real and vital asserted itself, and this girl was surely the high priestess of it all, the chief instrument of its accomplishment. New thoughts with new interpretation flooded his mind as she walked beside him through the winding streets, while the picturesque old gabled town, softly colored in the sunset, had never appeared to him so woefully wonderful and seductive. And only one curious incident came to disturb and puzzle him, slight in itself, but utterly inexplicable, bringing white terror into the child's face and a scream to her laughing lips. He had merely pointed to a column of blue smoke that arose from the burning autumn leaves and made a picture against the red roofs, and had then run to the wall and called her to his side to watch the flames shooting here and there through the heap of rubbish. Yet at the sight of it, as though taken by surprise, her face had altered dreadfully, and she had turned and run like the wind calling out wild sentences to him as she ran, of which he had not understood a single word, except that the fire apparently frightened her, and she wanted to get quickly away from it, and to get him away too. Yet five minutes later she was as calm and happy again as though nothing had happened to alarm or waken troubled thoughts in her, and they had both forgotten the incident. They were leaning over the ruined ramparts together, listening to the weird music of the band as he had heard it the first day of his arrival, it moved him again profoundly, as it had done before, and somehow he managed to find his tongue and his best French. The girl leaned across the stones, close beside him. No one was about. Driven by some remorseless engine within, he began to stammer something. He hardly knew what of his strange admiration for her. Almost at the first word, she sprang lightly off the wall and came up smiling in front of him, just touching his knee as he sat there. She was hatless as usual, and the sun caught her hair and one side of her cheek and throat. Oh, I'm so glad, she cried, 
clapping her little hands softly in his face. So very glad because that means that if you like me, you must also like what I do and what I belong to. Already he regretted bitterly having lost control of himself. Something in the phrasing of her sentence chilled him. He knew the fear of embarking upon an unknown and dangerous sea. You will take part in our real life, I mean, she added softly, with an indescribable coaxing of manner, as though she noticed his shrinking. You will come back to us. Already the slip of a child seemed to dominate him. He felt her power coming over him more and more. Something emanated from her that stole over his senses and made him aware that her personality, for all its simple grace, held forces that were stately, imposing August. He saw her again moving through smoke and flame amid broken and temptuous scenery. Alarmingly strong, her terrible mother by her side. Dimly this shone through her smile and appearance of charming innocence. You will, I know, she repeated, holding him with her eyes. They were quite alone up there on the ramparts, and the sensation that she was overmastering him stirred a wild sensuousness in his blood. The mingled abandon and reserve in her attracted him furiously, and all of him that was man rose up and resisted the creeping influence, at the same time acclaiming it with the full delight of his forgotten youth. An irresistible desire came to him to question her, to summon what still remained to him of his own little personality in an effort to retain the right to his normal self. The girl had grown quiet again and was now leaning on the broad wall close beside him, gazing out across the darkening plain, her elbows on the coping, motionless as a figure carved in stone. He took his courage in both hands. Tell me, Ilse, he said, unconsciously imitating her own purring softness of voice, yet aware that he was utterly in earnest. What is the meaning of this town? And what is this real life you speak of? And why is it that the people... Watch me from morning to night. Tell me what it all means. And tell me, he added, more quickly with passion in his voice, what you really are, yourself. She turned her head and looked at him through half-closed eyelids, her growing inner excitement betraying itself by the faint color that ran like a shadow across her face. It seems to me, he faltered oddly under her gaze, that I have some right to know. Suddenly she opened her eyes to the full. You love me then? She asked softly. I swear, he cried petuously, moved as by the force of a rising tide. It never felt before. I have never known any other girl who, then you, have the right to know. She calmly interrupted his confused confession. For love shares all secrets. She paused, and a thrill like fire ran swiftly through him. Her words lifted him off the earth, and he felt a radiant happiness followed almost the same instant in horrible contrast by the thought of death. He became aware that she had turned her eyes upon his own and was speaking again. The real life I speak of, she whispered, is the old, old life within, the life of long ago, the life to which you, too, once belong, into which you still belong. A faint wave of memory troubled the deeps of his soul as her low voice sank into him. What she was saying he knew instinctively to be true, even though he could not yet understand its full purport. His present life seemed slipping from him as he listened, merging his personality in one that was far older and greater. It was this loss of his present self that brought to him the thought of death. You came here, she went on, with a purpose of seeking it. and The people felt your presence and are waiting to know what you decide, whether you will leave them without having found it or whether her eyes remained fixed upon his own. But her face began to change, growing larger and darker with an expression of age. It is their thoughts constantly playing about your soul that makes you feel they watch you. They do not watch you with their eyes. The purposes of their inner life are calling to you, seeking to claim you. You were all part of the same life long, long ago, and now they want you back again among them. Vanzen's timid heart sank with dread as he listened. But the girl's eyes held him with a net of joy, so that he had no wish to escape. She fascinated him as it were clean out of his normal self. Alone, however, the people could never have caught and held you, she resumed. The motive force was not strong enough, it has faded through all these years, but I... She paused a moment and looked at him with complete confidence in her splendid eyes. I possess the spell to conquer you and hold you, the spell of old love. I can win you back again and make you live the old life with me. 
for the force of the ancient tie between us. If I choose to use it, it is unresistible, and I do not choose to use it. I still want you and you, dear soul, of my dim past. She pressed closer to him so that her breath passed across his eyes and her voice positively sang. I mean to have you, for you love me and are utterly at my mercy. When Zan heard, and yet did not hear, understood yet did not understand, he had passed into a condition of exaltation. The world was beneath his feet, made of music and flowers, and he was flying somewhere far above it through the sunshine of pure delight. He was breathless and giddy with the wonder of her words. They intoxicated him, and still, the terror of it all, the dreadful thought of death pressed ever behind her sentences. For flames shot through her voice out of the black smoke and licked at his soul. And they communicated with one another. It seemed to him by a process of swift telepathy, for his friend she could never have compassed all he said to her. Yet she understood perfectly, and what she said to him was like the recital of verses long since known, and the mingled pain and sweetness of it, as he listened were almost more than his little soul could hold. Yet I came here wholly by chance, he heard himself saying. No, she cried with passion. You came here because I called to you. I have called to you for years, and you came with the whole force of the past behind you. You had to come, for I own you, and I claim you. She rose again and moved closer, looking at him with a certain insolence in the face, the insolence of power. The sun had set behind the towers of the old cathedral, and the darkness rose up from the plain and enveloped them. The music of the band had ceased. The leaves of the plane trees hung motionless, but the chill of the autumn evening rose about them and made Van Zandt shiver. There was no sound but the sound of their voices and the occasional soft rustle of the girl's dress. He could hear the blood rushing in his ears. He scarcely realized that where he was and what he was doing. Some terrible magic of the imagination drew him deeply down into the tombs of his own being, telling him, and no unfaltering voice, that her words shadowed forth the truth. And this simple little French maid speaking beside him with so strange authority he saw curiously alter into quite another being. As he stared into her eyes, the picture in his mind grew and lived, dressing itself vividly to his inner vision with a degree of reality he was compelled to acknowledge. As once before he saw her tall and stately, moving through wild and broken scenery of forest and mountain caverns, the glare of flames behind her head and clouds of shifting smoke about her feet. Dark leaves encircled her hair, flying loosely in the wind, and her limbs shone through the merest rags of clothing. Others were about her, too, and ardent eyes on all sides cast delirious glances upon her. But her own eyes were always for one only, one whom she held by the hand, for she was leading the dance in some tempestuous orgy to the music of chanting voices. The dance she led circled about a great and awful figure on a throne, brooding over the scene through lurid vapors, while innumerable others with wild faces and forms crowded furiously about her in the dance, but the one she held by the hand he knew to be himself, and the monstrous shape upon the throne he knew to be her mother. The vision rose within him, rushing to him down the long years of buried time, crying aloud to him with a voice of memory reawakened. And then the scene faded away and he saw the clear circle of the girl's eyes gazing steadfastly into his own, and she became once more the pretty little daughter of the innkeeper, and he found his voice again. I knew, he whispered tremblingly, you child of visions and enchantment, how is it that you so bewitch me that I loved you even before I saw? She drew herself up beside him with an air of rare dignity. The call of the past, she said, and besides, she added proudly, in the real life, I am a princess. A princess, he cried, and my mother is a queen. At this little Venzen utterly lost his head. The light toward his heart and swept him into sheer ecstasy. To hear that the sweet singing voice and to see those adorable little lips utter such things upset his balance beyond all hope of control. He took her in his arms and covered her unresisting face with kisses. But even while he did so, and while the hot passion swept him, he felt that she was soft and loathsome, and that her answering kiss sustained his very soul. And when presently she had freed herself and vanished into the darkness, he stood there leaning against the wall in a state of collapse, creeping with horror from the touch of her yielding body and inwardly raging at the weakness that he already dimly realized must prove his undoing. 
and from the shadows of the old building into which she disappeared, there rose in the stillness of the night a singular long-drawn cry, which at first he took for laughter, but which later he was sure he recognized as the almost human wailing of a cat. Part 5 For a long time Van Zan leant there against the wall, alone with his surging thoughts and emotions. He understood at length that he had done the one thing necessary to call down upon him the whole force of this ancient past, for in those passionate kisses he had acknowledged the tie of olden days and had revived it, and the memory of that soft and palpable caress in the darkness of the inn corridor came back to him with a shudder. The girl had first mastered him and then led him to the one act that was necessary for her purpose. He had been waylaid after the lapse of centuries, caught and conquered. Dimly he realized this and sought to make plans for his escape. But for the moment, at any rate, he was powerless to manage his thoughts or will. For the sweet, fantastic madness of the whole adventure mounted to his brain like a spell, and he gloried in the feeling that he was utterly enchanted and moving in a world so much larger and wilder than the one he had ever been accustomed to. The moon, pale and enormous, was just rising over the sea-like plain, and at last he rose to go. Her slanting rays drew all the houses into new perspective, so that their roofs, already glistening with dew, seemed to stretch much higher into the sky than usual, and their gables and quaint old towers lay far away in its purple reaches. The cathedral appeared unreal in a silver mist. He moved softly, keeping to the shadows, but the streets were all deserted and very silent. The doors were closed, the shutters fastened. Not a soul was astir. The hush of night lay over everything. It was like a town of the dead, a churchyard with gigantic and grotesque tombstones. Wondering where all the busy life of the day had so utterly disappeared to, he made his way to a back door that entered the inn by means of the stables, thinking thus to reach his room unreserved. He reached the courtyard safely and crossed it by keeping close to the shadows of the wall. He sidled down it, mincing along on tiptoes, just as the old men did when they entered the salle à manger. He was horrified to find himself doing this instinctively. A strange impulse came to him, catching him somehow in the center of his body, an impulse to drop upon all fours and run swiftly and silently. He glanced upwards, and the idea came to him to leap up upon his window sill overhead instead of going round by the stairs. This occurred to him as the easiest and most natural way. It was like the beginning of some horrible transformation of himself into something else. He was fearfully strung up. The moon was higher now, and the shadows very dark along the sides of the street where he moved. He kept among the deepest of them and reached the porch with the glass doors. But here there was light. The inmates, unfortunately, were still about. Hoping to slip across the hall unobserved and reach the stairs, he opened the door carefully and stole in. Then he saw that the hall was not empty. A large, dark thing lay against the wall on his left. At first he thought it must be a household article's. Then it moved, and he thought that it was an immense cat, distorted in some way by the play of light and shadow. Then it rose straight up before him, and he saw that it was the proprietress. What she had been doing in this position, he could only venture a dreadful guess. But the moment she stood up and faced him, he was aware of some terrible dignity, clothing her about that instantly recalled the girl's strange saying that she was a queen. Huge and sinister, she stood there under the little oil lamp, alone with him in the empty hall. All stirred in his heart in the roots of some ancient fear. He felt that he must bow to her, make some kind of obeisance. The impulse was fierce and irresistible, as of long habit. He glanced quickly about him. There was no one there. Then he deliberately inclined his head towards her. He bowed. And fan, monsieur, c'est dans cette idée, c'est bien alors, j'en suis content. Her voice became to him sonorously as though from a great open space. Then the great figure came suddenly across the flagged hall at him and seized his trembling hands. Some overpowering force moved with her and caught him. On pourrait faire un petit tour ensemble. Ne pas, New Orleans, cette nuit, il faut cesser un peu d'avance pour cela. Il sait, il sait, viens donc ici, viens vite. And she whirled him around in the opening steps of some dance that seemed oddly and horribly familiar. They made no sounds in the stones, the strangely assorted couple. It was all soft and stealthy, and presently, when the air seemed to thicken, like smoke and a red glare as a flame shot through it, he is aware that someone else had joined them, and that his hand, 
the mother had released was now tightly held by the daughter. Issei had come in answer to the call, and he saw her with leaves of vervain twined in her dark hair, clothed in tattered vestiges of some curious garment, beautiful as the night and horribly, odiously, lonesomely seductive. To the Sabbath! To the Sabbath! They cried, On to the witch's Sabbath! Up and down that narrow hall they danced, the women on each side of him to the wildest measure he had ever imagined, yet which he dimly, dreadfully remembered, till the lamp on the walls flickered and went out, and they were left in total darkness, and the devil woke in his heart with a thousand vile suggestions and made him afraid. Suddenly they released his hand, and he heard the voice of the mother cry that it was time and they must go. Which way they went he did not pause to see. He only realized that he was free, and he blundered through the darkness till he found the stairs and then tore up them to his room as though all hell was at his heels. He flung himself on the sofa with his face in his hands and groaned, swiftly reviewing a dozen ways of immediate escape, all equally impossible. He finally decided that the only thing for him to do at the moment was to sit quiet and wait. He must see what was going to happen. At least in the privacy of his own bedroom, he could be fairly safe. The door was locked. He crossed over and softly opened the window which gave upon the courtyard and also permitted a partial view of the hall through the glass doors. As he did so, the hum and murmur of a great activity reached his ears from the streets beyond, the sound of footsteps and voices muffled by distance. He leaned out cautiously and listened. The moonlight was clear and strong now, but his own window was in shadow, the silver disc being still behind the house. It came to him irresistibly that the inhabitants of the town who a little while before had all been invisible behind closed doors, were now issuing forth busy upon some secret and unholy errand. He listened intently. At first, everything about him was silent, but soon he became aware of movements going on in the house itself. Rustlings and creepings came to him across that still moonlit yard. A concourse of living beings sent the hum of their activity into the night. Things were on the move everywhere. A biting, pungent odor rose through the air, coming he knew not whence. Presently his eyes became glued to the windows of the opposite wall, where the moonshine fell in a soft blaze. The roof overhead and behind him was reflected clearly in the panes of glass, and he saw the outlines of dark bodies moving with long footsteps over the tiles and along the coping. They passed swiftly and silently, shaped like immense cats, and an endless procession across the pictured glass and then appeared to leap down to a lower level, where he lost sight of them. He just caught the soft thudding of their leaps. Sometimes their shadows fell upon the white wall opposite, and then he could not make out whether they were the shadows of human beings or of cats. They seemed to change swiftly from one to the other. The transformation looked horribly real, for they leaped like human beings, yet changed swiftly in the air immediately afterwards and dropped like animals. The yard too beneath him was now alive with the creeping movements of dark forms all stealthily drawing towards the porch with the glass doors. They kept so closely to the wall that he could not determine their actual shape, but when he saw that they passed on to the great congregation that was gathering in the hall, he understood that these were the creatures whose leaping shadows he had first seen reflected in the window panes opposite. They were coming from all parts of the town, reaching the appointed meeting place across the roofs and tiles, and springing from level to level till they came to the yard. Then a new sound caught his ear, and he saw that all the windows all about were being softly opened, and that to each window came a face. A moment later, figures began dropping hurriedly down into the yard, and these figures, as they lowered themselves down from the windows, were human, he saw, but once safely in the yard, they fell upon all fours and changed in the swiftest possible second into cats, huge silent cats. They ran in streams to join the main body in the hall beyond. So after all, the rooms in the houses had not yet been empty and unoccupied. Moreover, what he saw no longer filled him with amazement, for he remembered it all. It was familiar. It had all happened before just so hundreds of times, and he himself had taken part in it and known the wild madness of it all. The outline of the old building changed, the yard grew larger, and he seemed to be staring down upon it from a much greater height through smoky vapors, and as he looked, half remembering the old pains of long ago, fierce and sweet, furiously assailed him, and the blood stirred horribly as he heard the call of the dance again in his heart and tasted the ancient magic of Issei whirling by his side. Suddenly he started back, 
a great lithe cat had leaped softly up from the shadows below on the sill, close to his face, and he was staring fixedly at him with the eyes of a human. Come, it seemed to say, come with us to the dance. Change as of old. Transform yourself swiftly and come. Only too well he understood the creature's soundless call. It was gone again. In a flash, with scarcely a sound of its padded feet on the stones, and then others dropped by the score down the sides of the house, past his very eyes, all changing as they fell, and darting away rapidly, softly towards the gathering point, and again he felt the dreadful desire to do likewise, to murmur the old incantation and then drop upon hands and knees, and run swiftly for the great flying leap into the air. Oh, how the passion of it rose within him like a flood, twisting his very entrails, sending his heart's desires flaming forth into the night for the old, old dance of the sorcerers at the witch's sabbath. The whirl of the stars was about him. Once more he met the magic of the moon, the power of the wind rushing from precipice and forest, leaping from cliff to cliff across the valleys, tore him away. He heard the cries of the dancers and their wild laughter, and with the savage girl in his embrace he danced furiously about the dim throne where sat the figure with the scepter of majesty. Then suddenly all became hushed and still, and the fever died down a little in his heart. The calm moonlight flooded a courtyard empty and deserted. They had started, the procession was off into the sky, and he was left behind alone. Venzan tiptoed softly across the room and unlocked the door. The murmur from the street, growing momentarily as he advanced, met his ears. He made his way with the utmost caution down the corridor. At the head of the stairs he paused and listened. Below him the hall, where they had gathered, was dark and still. But through open doors and windows on the farther side of the building came the sound of a great throng moving further and further into the distance. He made his way down the creaking wooden stairs, dreading yet longing to meet some straggler who should point the way but finding no one across the dark hall, so lately thronged with living, moving things, and out through the open front doors into the street. He could not believe that he had really left behind, really forgotten, that he had been purposely permitted to escape. It perplexed him. Nervously he peered about it and up and down the street, then seeing nothing, advanced slowly down the pavement. The whole town, as he went, showed itself empty and deserted, as though a great wind had blown everything alive out of it. The doors and windows of the houses stood open to the night. Nothing stirred, moonlight and silence lay over all. The night lay about him like a cloak. The air, soft and cool, caressed his cheek like the touch of a great furry paw. He gained confidence and began to walk quickly, though still keeping to the shadowed side. Nowhere could he discover the faintest sign of the great unholy exodus he knew had just taken place. The moon sailed high over all in a sky cloudless and serene. Hardly realizing where he was going, he crossed the open marketplace and so came to the ramparts whence he knew a pathway descended to the high road and along which he could make good his escape to one of the little towns that lay to the northward and so to the railway. But first he paused and gazed out over the scene at his feet, where the great plain lay like a silver map of some dream country. The still beauty of it entered his heart, increasing his sense of bewilderment and unreality. No air stirred, the leaves of the plane tree stood motionless. The near details were defined with the sharpness of day against dark shadows, and in the distance the fields and woods melted away into haze and shimmering mistiness. But the breath caught in his throat, and he stood stock still as though transfixed when his gaze passed from the horizon and fell upon the near prospect in the depths of the valley at his feet. The whole lower slopes of the hill that lay hid from the brightness of the moon were aglow, and through the glare he saw countless moving forms, shifting thick and fast between the openings of the trees, while overhead, like leaves driven by the wind, he discerned flying shapes that hovered darkly one movement against the sky and then settled down with cries and weird singing through the branches into the region that was aflame. Spellbound, he stood and stared for a time that he could not measure, and then moved by one of the terrible impulses that seemed to control the whole adventure. He climbed swiftly upon the top of the broad coping and balanced the moment where the valley gaped at his feet. But in that very instant, as he stood hovering, a sudden movement among the shadows of the houses caught his eye, and he turned to see the outline of a large animal dart swiftly across the open space behind him and land with a flying leap upon the top of the wall a little lower down. It ran like the wind to his feet, and then rose up beside him upon the ramparts. 
A shiver seemed to run through the moonlight, and his sight trembled. For a second, his heart pulsed fearfully. Issei stood beside him, peering into his face. Some dark substance, he saw, stained the girl's face and skin, shining in the moonlight as she stretched her hand towards his. She was dressed in wretched, tattered garments that yet became her smilely. Rue and vervain twined about her temples. Her eyes glittered with unholy light. He only just controlled the wild impulse to take her in his arms and leap with her from their giddy perch into the valley below. See, she cried, pointing with an arm on which the rags fluttered in the rising wind towards the forest, a glow in the distance. See where they await us? The woods are alive. Already the great ones are there, and the dance will soon again. The salve is here. Anoint yourself and come. Though a moment before the sky was clear and cloudless, yet even while she spoke the face of the moon grew dark and the wind began to toss in the crest of the plane trees at his feet. Stray gusts brought the sounds of hoarse singing and crying from the lower slopes of the hill and the pungent odor he had already noticed about the courtyard of the inn rose about him in the air. Transform! Transform! she cried again, her voice rising like a song. Rub well your skin before you fly. Come, come with me to the Sabbath, to the madness of its furious delight, to the sweet abandonment of its evil worship. See, the great ones are there, and the terrible sacraments prepared. The throne is occupied. Anoint and come. Anoint and come. She grew to the height of a tree beside him, leaping upon the wall with flaming eyes and hair strewn upon the night. He too began to change swiftly. Her hands touched the skin of his face and neck, streaking him with a burning salve that sent the old magic into his blood with the power before which fades all that is good. A wild roar came up to his ears from the heart of the wood, and the girl, when she heard it, leaped upon the wall in the frenzy of her wicked joy. Satan is there, she screamed, rushing upon him and striving to draw him with her to the edge of the wall. Satan has come. The sacraments call us. Come with your dear apostate soul. We will worship and dance till the moon dies and the world is forgotten. Just saving himself from the dreadful plunge, Ben Sand struggled to release himself from her grasp while the passion tore at his reins and all but mastered him. He shrieked aloud, not knowing what he said, and then she shrieked again. It was the old impulses, the old awful habits instinctively finding voice. For though it seemed to him that he merely shrieked nonsense, the words he uttered really had meaning in them. And when intelligible, it was the ancient call and it was heard below. It was answered. The wind whistled at the skirts of his coat as the year around him darkened with many flying forms crowding upwards out of the valley. The crying of hoarse voices smote upon his ears. Coming closer, strokes of wind buffeted him tearing him this way and that along the crumbling top of the stone wall, and Ilse clung to him with her long, shining arms, smooth and bare, holding him fast about the neck, but not Ilse alone, for a dozen of them surrounded him, dropping out of the air. The pungent odor of the anointed body stifled him, exciting him to the old madness of the Sabbath, the dance of the witches and sorcerers doing honor to the personified evil of the world. Anoint in a way, and anoint in a way, they cried, and wild chorus about him to the dance that never dies to the sweet and fearful fantasy of evil another moment and he would have yielded and gone for his will turned soft and the flood of passionate memory all but overwhelmed him when so can a small thing alter the whole course of an adventure he caught his foot upon a loose stone in the edge of the wall and then fell with a sudden crash onto the ground below but he fell towards the houses in the open space of dust and cobblestones and fortunately not into the gaping death of the valley on the further side and they too came in tumbling heap about him, like flies upon a piece of food. But as they fell, he was released for a moment from the power of their touch. And in that brief instant of freedom, there flashed into his mind a sudden intuition that saved him. Before he could regain his feet, he saw them scrabbling awkwardly back upon the wall, as though bat-like they could fly by dropping from a height and had no hold upon him in the open. Then seeing them perched there in a row like cats upon a roof, all dark and singularly shapeless, their eyes like lamps, a sudden memory came back to him of Ilse's terror at the sight of fire. Quick as a flash, he found his matches and lit the dead leaves that lay under the wall. Dry and withered, it caught fire at once, and the wind carried the flames in a long line down the length of the wall, licking upwards as it ran, and with shrieks and wailings the crowded row of forms upon the top melted into the air on the other side and were gone with a great rush and whirring of their bodies down into the heart of the haunted valley leaving Venzen breathless and shaken in the middle of the deserted ground. Ilse, he cried feebly, Ilse, 
for his heart ached to think that she was really gone to the great dance without him, and that he had lost the opportunity of its fearful joy. Yet at the same time his relief was so great, and he was so dazed and troubled in mind with the whole thing that he hardly knew what he was saying, and only cried aloud in the fierce storm of his emotion. The fire under the wall ran its course, and the moonlight came out again, soft and clear from its temporary eclipse, with one last shuddering look at the ruined ramparts and a feeling of horrid wonder for the haunted valley beyond, where the shapes still crowded and flew, he turned his face towards the town and slowly made his way in the direction of the hotel. And as he went, a great wailing of cries and a sound of howling followed him from the gleaming forest below, growing fainter and fainter with a burst of wind as he disappeared between the houses. Part 6 It may seem rather abrupt to you, this sudden tame ending, said Arthur Van Zandt, glancing with flushed face and timid eyes at Dr. Silence sitting there with his notebook. But the fact is, from the moment of my memory seems to have failed rather, I have no distinct recollection of how I got home or what precisely I did. It appears I never went back to the inn at all. I only dimly recollect racing down a long white road in the moonlight, past woods and villages till, and I came upon the deserted road and then the dawn came up and I saw the towers of the biggish town and so came to a station. But long before that, I remember pausing somewhere on the road and looking back to where the hill town of my adventure stood up in the moonlight and thinking how exactly like a great monstrous cat it lay there upon the plain, its huge from paws lying down the two main streets and the twin and broken towers of the cathedral marking its torn ears against the sky. That picture stays in my mind with the utmost vividness to this day. Another thing remains in my mind from that escape, namely the sudden sharp reminder that I had not paid my bill and the decision I made standing there on the dusty high road that the small baggage I had held behind would more than settle for my indebtedness. For the rest, I can only tell you that I got coffee and bread at a cafe on the outskirts of this town I had come to and soon after found my way to the station and caught a train later in the day. That same evening, I reached London. And how long altogether, asked John Silence quietly, do you think you stayed in the town of the adventure? Van Zandt looked up sheepishly. I was coming to that, he resumed, with apologetic wiggling of his body. In London, I found that I was a whole week out in my reckoning of time. I'd stayed over a week in that town, and it ought to have been September 15th, instead of which it was only September 10th. So then, reality, you had only stayed a night or two in the inn, queried the doctor. When Zan hesitated before replying, he shuffled upon the mat. I must have gained time somewhere, he said at length. Somewhere or somehow, I certainly had a week to my credit. I can't explain it. I can only give you the fact. And this happened to you last year, since when you have never been back to that place? Last autumn, yes, murmured Van Zandt, and I have never dared to go back. I think I never want to. And tell me, asked Dr. Silence at length, when he saw that the little man had evidently come to the end of his words and had nothing more to say, had you ever read up the subject of the old witchcraft practices during the Middle Ages or been at all interested in the subject? Never, declared Van Zandt emphatically. I had never given a thought to such matters so far as I know, or to the question of reincarnation, perhaps. Never. Before my adventure, but I have since replied significantly. There was, however, something still in the man's mind that he wished to relieve himself of. My confession, yet could with difficulty bring himself to mention, it was only after the sympathetic tactfulness of the doctor had provided numerous openings that at length he availed himself of one of them and stammered that he would like to show him the marks he still had on his neck where he said the girl had touched them with her anointed hands. He took off his clothes after infinite fumbling hesitation and lowered his shirt a little for the doctor to see, and there on the surface of the skin lay a faint reddish line across the shoulder and extending a little way down the back towards the spine. It certainly indicated exactly the position an arm might have taken in the act of embracing, and on the other side of the neck, slightly higher up, was a similar mark, though not quite so clearly defined. That was where she held me that night on the ramparts, he whispered, a strange light coming and going in his eyes. It was some weeks later when I again found occasion to consult John's silence concerning another extraordinary case that had come under my notice and we fell to discussing Van Zandt's story. Since hearing it, the doctor had made investigation on his own account and one of his secretaries had discovered that Van Zandt's ancestors had actually lived for generations in the very town where the adventure came to him. 
Two of them, both women, had been tried and convicted as witches and had been burned alive at the stake. Moreover, it had not been difficult to prove that the very inn where Van Zandt stayed was built about 1700, upon the spot where the funeral pyres stood and the executions took place. The town was a sort of headquarters for all the sorcerers and witches of the entire region, and after conviction they were burnt there, literally by scores. It seems strange, continued the doctor, that Van Zandt should have remained ignorant of all this, but, on the other hand, it was not the kind of history that successive generations would have been anxious to keep alive or to repeat to their children. Therefore, I am inclined to think he still knows nothing about it. The whole adventure seems to have been a very vivid revival of the memories of an earlier life, caused by coming directly into contact with a living force still intense enough to hang about the place, and by a most singular chance, too, with the very souls who had taken part with him in the events of that particular life. For the mother and daughter who impressed him so strangely must have been leading actors with himself in the scenes and practices of witchcraft, which at that period dominated the imagination of the whole country. One has to read the histories of the times to know that these witches claimed the power of transforming themselves into various animals, both for the purpose of disguise and also to convey themselves swiftly to the scenes of their imaginary orgies. Lycanthropy, or the power to change themselves into wolves, was everywhere believed in, and the ability to transform themselves into cats by rubbing their bodies with a special salve or ointment provided by Satan himself found equal credence. The witchcraft trials abound in evidence of such universal beliefs. Dr. Silence quoted chapter and verse from many writers on the subject and showed how every detail of Van Zandt's adventure had a basis in the practices of those dark days. But that the entire affair took place subjectively in the man's own consciousness, I have no doubt, he went on, in reply to my questions. For my secretary, who has been to the town to investigate, discovered his signature in the visitor's book and proved by it that he arrived on September 8th and left suddenly without paying his bill. He left two days later, and they still were in possession of his dirty brown bag and some tourist clothes. I paid a few francs in settlement of his debt and have sent his luggage on to him. The daughter was absent from home, but the proprietress, a large woman, very much as he described her, told my secretary that he had seemed a very strange, absent-minded kind of gentleman, and after his disappearance she had feared for a long time that he had met with a violent end in the neighboring forest where he used to roam about alone. I should like to have obtained a personal interview with the daughter so as to ascertain how much was subjective and how much actually took place with her as Van Zandt told it. For her dread of fire and the sight of burning must, of course, have been the intuitive memory of her former painful death at the stake, and have thus explained why he fancied more than once that he saw her through smoke and flame. And that mark on his skin, for instance, I inquired. Really the marks produced by hysterical brooding, he replied, like the stigmata of the religious, and the bruises which appear on the bodies of hypnotized subjects have been told to expect them. This is very common and easily explained. Only it seems curious that these marks should have remained so long in Van Zandt's case. Usually they disappear quickly. Obviously he's still thinking about it all brooding and living it all over again, I ventured. Probably. And this makes me fear that the end of his trouble is not yet. We shall hear of him again. It is a case, alas, I can do little to alleviate. Dr. Silence spoke gravely and with sadness in his voice. And what do you make of the Frenchman in the train, I asked further. The man who warmed him against the place, a cause to Sommel, a cause de shots, surely a very singular incident. A very singular incident indeed, he made answer slowly, and one I can only explain on the basis of a highly improbable coincidence. Namely, that the man was one who had himself stayed in the town and undergone there a similar experience. I should like to find this man and ask him, but the crystal is useless here, for I have no slightest clue to go upon, and I can only conclude that some singular psychic affinity, some force still active in his being, out of the same past life, drew him thus to the personality of Venzan, and enabled him to fear what might happen to him, and thus to warm as he did. Yes, he presently continued, half talking to himself. I suspect in this case that Venzan was swept into the vortex of forces, arising out of that intense activities of a past life that he lived over again a scene in which he had often played a leading part centuries before. For strong actions set up forces that are so slow to exhaust themselves. They may be said in a sense never to die. 
In this case, they were not vital enough to render the illusions complete, so that the little man found himself caught in a very distressing confusion of the present and the past. Yet he was sufficiently sensitive to recognize that it was true and to fight against the power of degradation, of returning even in his memory to a former and lower state of development. Ah, yes, he continued, crossing the floor to gaze at the darkening sky, and seemingly quite oblivious of my presence. Subliminal uprushes of memory like this can be exceedingly painful, and sometimes exceedingly dangerous. I only trust that this gentle soul may soon escape from this obsession, while passionate and tempestuous pass. But I doubt it. I doubt it. His voice was hushed with sadness as he spoke, and when he turned back into the room again there was an expression of profound yearning upon his face, the yearning of a soul whose desire to help is sometimes greater than his power.